Republicans and Democrats don't agree on much, but one thing that seems to unite them is the desire to reform our prisons. The far left wants to close or even abolish prisons as prisons altogether. Even leading figures on the right think that we are locking too many people up. They want to give convicts a first step back into the public. One of the most prominent faces of prison reform is a man named Sheldon Johnson. Johnson was a gangster who was released from prison last May after spending 25 years in prison for murder. A long time, though perhaps not so long given that he murdered someone. Anyway, since he was released, Johnson has become a major advocate for prison reform, appearing on all sorts of media outlets, including Joe Rogan just last month. You have a whole bunch of different um, um, entities under this one large umbrella, right? And I remember I was getting paid 17 cent an hour at one point in time, 19 cent an hour. And, um, you know, for, for operating these big machines and they were producing just like a mass amount of... A, a Corecraft is actually a Fortune 500 uh, corporation, and they function, they, 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 they regulate out of the prison industrial complex. The prison industrial complex. He was being paid slave wages, terribly unjust. So anyway, that guy was just arrested again, again for murder. And not just murder. He was arrested after having been caught on surveillance video disguised in a blonde wig in an apartment with a dismembered body. When police entered the apartment and arrested Johnson, they found the dead man's torso, uh, initially, no head or arms. That's when they looked in the freezer where they found the aforementioned body parts, at which point they arrested this inspiring figure of prison reform, all of which is a reminder. We are in great need of prison reform in this country. We don't arrest nearly enough people. We don't punish the criminals that we do arrest nearly enough. And no amount of confused moral preening from the pseudo-social justice prison reformers can change the fact that their activism is the reason there's a head in a freezer in the Bronx. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. The pro activists who insist that nothing they do is in any way a cult or demonic, they are dressing up like demons to testify before the Missouri legislature. We'll get to that in just a moment. First though, you got to subscribe. You got to ring that bell. Smash the thing. Do the doodad. You got to, you got to hit it. You might be able to tell that I'm not in studio right now. I'm in Washington, D.C. I was in town in D.C. last night for the State of the Union. I was the guest of Congressman Andy Ogles. Very very uh, grateful to have been there, even though the speech was, and I say this without hyperbole or exaggeration or needless provocation, it was the worst state of the union in my lifetime of any president. I don't really remember the George H.W. Bush states of the union, state of the union addresses because I was uh, one and two years old, but uh, all the Clinton ones, which were pretty bad, the Bush ones, which weren't great, the Obama ones, which were there was one in particular that was terrible, and we saw echoes of that last night. The Trump ones were fine, and this one was just by far the worst. Now, the first thing I noticed when I showed up for the State of the Union was that there was a big, beautiful wall around the Capitol. The Capitol is supposed to be the people's house. Sometimes we refer to the White House as the people's house, but really, more specifically, it is the Capitol, because the, the Capitol represents the legislature. This is supposed to be the most responsive, the most repetitive part of the government. You elect your members of Congress every two years. You elect your senators every six years. Uh, every district elects one. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, so the fact that there is a wall up around the Capitol raises the question, who are they trying to keep out? They're, they're trying to keep you out. They're trying to keep out the American people, specifically the horn hat guys, right? and then and the guys taking Nancy Pelosi's lectern while smiling at the camera. They're afraid that you're going to break in. They're not afraid that North Korea is going to break in. They're not afraid that Russia is going to break in. And it's very strange that they would erect this big, beautiful wall because as they're erecting it, they're making the argument that walls don't work. We've heard this argument for years. Walls, don't, that's why we shouldn't build a wall on our southern border. They don't work, don't you know? And they're very cruel. That, that part never made any sense because if they don't work, they can't be cruel because they don't have any effect in the world. And if they're cruel, then that means they probably work. 
But what we're now being told is walls on the southern border do not work, and that's why the federal government needs to go in and take them down when the state of Texas erects them. But walls in the Capitol do work. All of which is to say, the ruling class, the federal government, views the American people as a far greater threat than it views foreign nationals unvetted who are pouring across the border by the millions every year. It's just the first thing I noticed. This issue of migration, which is right toward the top of people's minds, did not come up until way late into President Biden's speech. So I was there, it took a long time to leave the Capitol last night. Then I might have uh, gone out, had a cigar with some legislator friends of mine, and uh, I didn't get the clips. And I don't think you need the clips. You were watching the Daily Wire backstage last night. If you just have ever heard an old man screaming for one hour and eight minutes, you heard the State of the Union address. There were a few moments, though, worth calling your attention to. So he opens up, and clearly what Biden is trying to do is to prove that he is vigorous, that he's alive, he's not just being strung up by marionette marionette strings. And so he decides to yell. But there was something hollow about it. Yes, he yelled. Yes, he had energy. He lasted over an hour. I was trying to figure out the over-under with some of the other guests in the gallery in the Capitol. And we said, look, he can't, it can't be 30 minutes. It'll be a national scandal if it's 30 minutes. It'll prove he can't speak for too long. So I don't even think it could be under 40. I thought it would be about 46 and a half minutes. It, it was over an hour, and he kept up the same tone all the time, which was something uh, like this. And he was, he was speaking very, very quickly. I don't know if it's because of whatever drug they injected into him or if it's because he just wanted to get through it or he thought that speed would, you know, give him kind of Ben Shapiro powers to seem very energetic. But in any case, the tone didn't match the substance. It seemed hollow. It seemed like a, a bad theatrical performance. So then he's talking about all sorts of nonsense. He's talking about how there are fewer potato chips in the bag of potato chips, which is true. That's actually a consequence of shrinkflation, which is a consequence of his terrible spending policies. It's not just because the potato chip companies decided all of a sudden that they really want to uh, uh, screw over the customer or something. The potato chip companies always want to make money. But at this moment where inflation is going through the roof because of terrible uh, Democrat spending in Washington, D.C., they decide, okay, we're going to raise the prices. We're also going to shrink the amount of goods that you're going to get. And that's how we're going to squeeze more money out of the customer. Uh, so he's talking about all this nonsense, not even getting to the, uh, the bigger issues like illegal immigration. Finally, he gets to illegal immigration and he has the audacity to blame the Republicans for not uh, enforcing the Southern border. So he says, and I had a bill, I had put a bill out there and the Democrats were all going to do it. The Republicans shut it down. The Donald Trump shut down my immigration bill. But it was, it was the most dishonest moment of the speech because Joe Biden is currently not enforcing immigration law. So the issue with the southern border right now is not that we don't have laws on the books. We do have laws on the books. Biden is choosing not to enforce them. And when Texas is going up and actually erecting parts of the wall, the Biden administration is trying to take down parts of the wall, is going to court to try to sue, to tear down parts of the wall that the Republicans in Texas are building. So this is why the Democrat immigration bill was always ridiculous. Okay, pass five more bills. It doesn't matter. The bills don't mean anything. The laws don't mean anything. If the executive branch isn't going to enforce those laws, Biden has proven he doesn't want to enforce the laws that are already on the books. That was very dishonest. But then it, it got really sad because there's this case of Lake and Riley. She's a Georgia student who was murdered ostensibly by an illegal immigrant, an illegal immigrant who was arrested in Texas, arrested in New York, and arrested in Georgia. Three times law enforcement let this guy off the hook. Three strikes, you're out. He goes and allegedly murders this young Georgia girl. And the Republicans were heckling and they said, say her name. We were all wearing uh, pins that said Lake and Riley or say her name. And, and finally, Biden, he couldn't quite tell. He said, oh, I'll say her name. And he said, Lincoln Riley. Lincoln Riley is the head coach of USC. Okay. And he, and he clearly just didn't, he didn't know who he was talking about. He didn't know what the issue was. He, he revealed himself to be very, very confused the moment that he went off teleprompter. The Democrats were up and down, jumping all night. The Republicans really didn't get off their seats much at all. Then you get to the end of the speech and you're waiting for any moment of, of inspiration. I mean, the whole thing had been so nasty. At one point he called out the Supreme Court and you can, you can actually hear it in the clip. He, he says, these judges, 
They're, they overruled Roe v. Wade. And you can hear one person in the entire joint session with all of the members of the House and all of the members of the Senate and the Supreme Court justices and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And there's one person who applauds at that moment. And that would be yours truly. That was the nearest that I had to an interruption uh, when he says, we, they, we, they overturned Roe v. Wade. And there was one person in the background who's applauding. Uh, that is me. That was my contribution to the 2024 State of the Union address. Uh, but he but he hammered it really, really hard, and he attacked the Supreme Court. He threatened them. He came out and he said, and you guys, you Supreme Court, all due respect, you're going to find out that women have power, and they've got electoral power, and they're going to make it hurt. I mean, he was, he was actually threatening them. The nearest I'd ever heard anything like that was during the Obama State of the Union, right around the Citizens United decision, where he criticized the court in a much more tempered way than, than Biden did last night, and Justice Alito famously mouthed, not true. Now Alito doesn't show up to the State of the Union anymore. So really, really nasty, really nasty. He kept bringing up Trump. You can tell the guy's so defensive. Then he gets to the end and you get this beautiful contradiction, which we'll get to in one second. First, I want to talk about something nice. I want to talk about Good Ranchers. Go check out goodranchers.com. Use code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. Did you know that mRNA vaccines are approved for use in pigs in the U.S.? Not to mention 85% of the beef sold in your local grocery store is imported. In fact, over 5 billion pounds of meat was imported just last year. The mystery continues to grow in the meat industry, and every day I am more thankful for good ranchers. I do not need to worry about imported meat or unknown vaccines in the food that I feed to my family. During their Say No to mRNA sale, Good Ranchers is offering you a free 10-pound Easter ham with any subscription. Their ham is fantastic. Unlike the pork at the store, it is guaranteed to be free from mRNA vaccines. This is a $119 value that you will get for free with code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at goodranchers.com. I really enjoy being in Washington, D.C. every now and again. One thing I really hate is that I am away from my Good Ranchers subscription and my wife and kids and family and stuff, but and the Good Ranchers especially is the thing. I love, go to goodranchers.com right now. Use code Knowles. Get your free Easter ham today. Every subscription will come with a free Heritage ham, 25 bucks off, and Good Ranchers lifetime quality commitment. Goodranchers.com, code Knowles. Good Ranchers American meat delivered. Finally, you say, Biden, give me anything. Give me something uplifting. Every other president manages to do it. Democrat, Republican, how about you? Stop being so mean and nasty and screaming all the time. And just give us something nice. And he tried to. He said, I'm only slightly paraphrasing. He said, America has always been about equality. We're all equal. That's what we are. We're America. We're equal. That's our enduring idea for all of American history. And then, not five seconds later, he says, and these Republicans want to take us back to our old ideas. We want we need new ideas, not old ideas. And you say, hold on, buddy, wait. You just <laughs> trying to analyze the argument here. You're saying America has always been about the old uh, enduring ideas are equality and all men are created equal. Okay, great. And that's what we need to get back to that. And also we need to throw out all our old ideas and only have new ideas because the old ideas are terrible. So the whole thing, it was incoherent. Not just because Biden's an old man who doesn't know what his name is, but, but two, because the speechwriters don't know what they're talking about. Because the Biden campaign doesn't know what it's about. What is Biden for? What is, what's the Biden movement about? It's not about anything. It's about Joe Biden wanted to be president since he was in the womb. And now he's president. He doesn't really know what to do with it. And he licks his finger, puts it up in the air. The speech last night was much more, it was more for the squad than it was for the centrists. It was more for the squad than it was for the Nikki Haley voters, the Bobby Kennedy voters. He wasn't trying to win over anyone in the middle. Now, maybe that was smart for Biden because he feels that he doesn't have his base shored up yet. He knows that uh, in the primaries, the Democrat primaries, he's losing 10% of his vote to uncommitted. He's losing hundreds of thousands of votes at a clip to anybody but Joe Biden. So the whole thing was very weak. It was very nasty. Uh, and, and that was the main story. Then the Republicans had their official response. The official response came from the uh, Alabama Senator Katie Britt, and it just flopped, and it always does. It's nothing against Katie Britt. It's the worst job in Washington, D.C. If they ever, are, this is a, just a bit of advice. If you listening to the show right now ever receive a call from the RNC, from the President of the United States, they say, we would like you to deliver the Republican response to the State of the Union. Just don't do it. Just hang up. Don't even respond. It's a thankless, terrible job. Uh, Katie Britt did her best, and it just, it wasn't that great. It, it they filmed it in a kitchen, and it was uh, this woman talking about, you know, common sense issues for all of us moms out there. And she, they're clearly trying to appeal to the, the uh, mythical 
suburban housewife who Trump apparently doesn't fare very well with. Uh, but as always, it just seemed forced and contrived. You know, the president gives the State of the Union to a joint session of Congress with every powerful politician in the country in front of him. The the most grand, uh, majestic setting in American politics. Even if the person giving the response gives, you know, the Gettysburg Address and the Pericles Funeral Oration combined, it's just not going to be that good. So it didn't didn't really matter. No one's going to remember it at all. Uh, Now now we're off to the races. Uh, Biden didn't help himself. The, The only way he helped himself was he proof that he can stay awake for an hour and eight minutes, which was impressive, and a lot of people didn't think he could. Otherwise, it was nasty. I don't think he really won a single vote that he didn't already have. Now, speaking of Democrats and votes, there's a beautiful story. There's a beautiful story here. Uh, Harris County District Attorney, this is a woman in Texas, Kim Ogg. She's a Democrat DA. She went to vote, and she goes to vote for herself, you know, for, for her office. She finds out somebody's already voted in her name. This is truly a chef's kiss at news story because, of course, this never happens. There are never any uh, mistakes of identity at the polling places. No, no, no. It's all locked down and Republicans are paranoid. And the only reason they want people to present their ID is to stop, you know, minorities or something from voting. No, uh, actually, this happens a fair bit. And it happened to a Democrat while she was trying to vote for herself. From the Houston Chronicle, a Harris County DA, Kim Ogg, went into Love Park Community Center Tuesday morning to cast a ballot for her own primary race, only to be told someone already voted in her name. That's according to this woman's spokesman. Uh, so what's the explanation? The explanation here, I guess Katie, Katie or Kim Ogg could rest easy because whenever people uh, vote in your name who aren't you, it, they're always Democrats. Maybe they're dead. Maybe they live somewhere else. But uh, in any case, it probably didn't change the outcome of the vote. The official explanation is that Kim Ogg was told that her partner, I don't know if she's a lesbian or if they're just using liberal language in this news article, but her, part, her partner, I don't know if it's her you know, accounting firm partner or something, uh, who lives at the same address, went to vote and an election worker pulled up the address and pulled up Kim Ogg's voter number instead. So they're saying, no, 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 it's not a big deal. It's not, it's not an illegal alien. It's not someone from a different county. It's not even someone down the street. It's, it's Kim Ogg's roommate, you know, say, I don't know, husband, lesbian, partner, whatever it is. I don't know. Pa- partner. Uh, that really shouldn't make you feel much better, actually. Because the point here is uh, not just that we... We want uh, the people who are eligible to vote or one of their really good friends. You know, we want the people to vote who are eligible to vote or, you know, their brother or something. I don't know if the person in Kim Ogg's home, be it her partner or her child or her mother-in-law or whoever, I don't know that that person's eligible to vote. I don't, I don't know anything about that. I don't know if that person's a felon. I don't know if that person's underage. I don't, here's what I know. If you request that voters prove that they are who they say they are, and they do this to go buy a pack of cigarettes, and they do this to go buy a bottle of wine, and they do this to travel, and they do this for anything, uh, if you do that, then we'll know for sure. And then this won't happen. This thing that we're told that never happens, which is apparently happening to Democrat politicians. Speaking of Democrat politicians, John Kerry who is still in government somehow. He's the climate czar for Joe Biden. He was previously Secretary of State for Barack Obama. He was previously a U.S. Senator for a bazillion years. And before that, he was an annoying sort of hippie protester. Uh, John Kerry is now combining all of those things. He is demanding that the Russian military, during its invasion of Ukraine, focus on what really, really matters. And that is, of course, reducing carbon emissions. I believe that... uh... Russia has the ability to be able to make enormous changes if it really wanted to. Uh, I mean, if Russia has the ability to wage a war illegally uh, and invade another country, uh, they ought to be able to find the effort to be responsible in the climate issue. Uh, And uh, unfortunately, because of the actions that Russia took in an unprovoked illegal war against another nation, Uh, We have not been engaged in discussions with Russia, sadly. I say sadly because it's a loss for the world not to be able to have Russia acting constructively on this issue. But um, 
We need every country, including Russia. Russia is one of the largest emitters of emitters in the world. If Russia wanted to show good faith, they could go out and announce what their reductions are going to be and make a greater effort to reduce emissions now. And maybe that would open up the door for people to feel better about uh, what Russia is choosing to do at this point in time. Please, Vladdy, while you're sending in those tanks and blowing up all of the Ukrainians with your missiles, would you please consider using a solar missile? Would you, perhaps would you consider a hybrid missile? Vladdy, be, please be responsible when you're blowing up the Ukrainians. Stop emitting all that carbon, Vladdy. A, a fanatic, it has been said, is a person who cannot change his mind and will not change the subject. And that's where we are. And it shows you just how seriously the Democrats really take the Ukraine war. They pretend it's the most important thing. For goodness sakes, Joe Biden opened up the State of the Union with the importance of the Ukraine war. And if you're not, you know, out there waving the Ukraine banner, or you're somehow a traitor to the United States or something. But they don't really take it seriously. They, they say, listen, all right, if you're going to keep shelling those damned Ukrainians, how about you at least use a, a lighter carbon footprint, buddy? It, it even shows that they don't take the, the climate change issue all that seriously either. It's just... It's just a, a way to pressure th their adversaries, their opponents, into just going along with the broader program because obviously climate change is not just a regional issue like the Ukraine war. Climate change is not just a, a class issue like raising taxes on a, a certain tax bracket or something. Climate change is, by its very nature, a global issue. All right, well, while you're you know, getting up to no good, just do whatever we want. Or the ooga booga booga sun monster is going to get you. Do what we want. Why won't you do what we want anymore? Now, speaking of important political issues, turning rather to important political issues, you ought to help those who are in need. That's why you ought to check out Food for the Poor. Go to foodforthepoor.org slash Knowles. Imagine the feeling of hunger gnawing at your stomach, the ache growing stronger with each passing hour. Now envision not just yourself, but also your children and your loved ones all experiencing this relentless craving. This is the harsh reality for millions worldwide struggling to put food on the table every day. Thankfully, Food for the Poor dedicates everything to helping those in need. Every dollar you give translates into meals, nourishment, and a chance for a better tomorrow. Thanks to a meal-for-meal -meal match, a donation of 80 bucks can feed two children for an entire year. 160 bucks would feed four children, and 320 bucks would feed eight children. Your donation to Food for the Poor is not just about giving... It's about sharing in the collective responsibility to ensure that no one goes to bed hungry. Together, we can be the change that we wish to see in the world. Donate right now by texting Knowles to 51555 or by visiting foodforthepoor.org slash Knowles. Text right now, pull your phone out, text Knowles, Canada W-L-E-S, to 51555 or go to foodforthepoor.org slash Knowles and thank you for your generous donation. My favorite comment yesterday is from, of course, you know, I don't really see the names of the commenters, but this person keeps getting picked. This is from the Drummer's Workshop. Norm's Music says, you know, it's one thing to bring back McDonald's crispy chicken sandwich. It's a whole other to bring back a freaking woolly mammoth. Uh, that's true. And it shows you, okay, it's kind of like the wall issue I was talking about at the top of the show when, you, when, when I got to the State of the Union last night. We can bring back a woolly mammoth. But we can't bring back functional borders on our, uh, on our southern side of our country. We, it's amazing, isn't it? We can, we can seemingly do amazing things. We've never had more technical power at our, our very fingertips. And yet the basic functioning of government, the basic things that lead to a flourishing society, we no longer seem capable. Is it because we're not capable or it's because we're not willing to do those things? I think it's obviously yeah, the latter. Now, speaking of turns of events that are leading our society astray. Uh, the scientists want you to be a hippie. They want you to be a druggie. They're telling you now, as according to a new study, that a single dose of LSD provides immediate and lasting relief from anxiety. So <laughs> this is a clinical trial, uh, has won a U.S. FDA breakthrough therapy status for an LSD formulation that is supposed to treat anxiety. And it's, this is called Mind Medicine Incorporated. 
They just announced the finding yesterday. This biopharmaceutical company is developing just a a, a fancier, more clinical version of, of LSD, you know, acid, this sort of thing that is made in a bathtub that your hippie friends wanted to take in college and probably turn them down the wrong path. So people are going to say, Michael, you're such a fuddy-duddy. What if this really works? I've had ostensibly right-wing people come to me and say, actually, LSD and psychedelic drugs show a lot of promise for treating all sorts of conditions, anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, maybe. But what does it mean that a single dose of this drug just cures you of this psychological disorder forever? Seems to me what that means is it permanently changes your brain. But what is anxiety? Is anxiety merely a physical condition? That's what we're told. The premise of all of these stories and these studies and these therapies is a materialist premise. It's the idea that everything is just atoms. So if you have anxiety, the modern liberal materialist will say, oh yeah, go do that drug. And if you do a strong enough drug, maybe it'll so rejigger your brain that it'll change your personality. It'll just kind of give you permanent brain damage and that, that way you won't be anxious anymore. But if you don't take a materialist view of humanity and reality, if you think that there's material things and then there's metaphysical things, you know, the material represents something that's immaterial, like our body, for instance, represents our soul and the two are joined together, then you got to ask yourself, okay, well, what's the, what's the deeper cause of anxiety? And for most people, I would wager it's not some uh, malformation in the brain. For most people, I would wager it's... Uh, a problem with their spouse or a problem with their parents or some aspect of their psychological development that went awry somewhere, maybe because of a trauma, maybe because of a poor education, maybe, but whatever it is, there's an issue that, according to the old kind of psychology, which would treat human beings as human beings, you could talk through, you could work through, you could come to some conclusions about, you could develop better habits, you could suppress certain vices, and you could be cured. But according to the new therapy, they say, oh no, you don't have a soul. Forget about your habits, whatever. Here, take this poison, give yourself brain damage, and then you'll be cured forever. What what does it mean to be cured in that way? You obviously haven't fixed the problem. Maybe you've numbed the problem. Maybe you've just changed your personality, but you haven't solved the problem. And I think that's that's what we've got going on. We Our modern medical treatments are not actually solving problems. They're maybe treating some symptoms in some cases, though, they're making the problems worse. You see this most clearly with the <laughs> affirmation. With the <laughs> affirmation, you got a, a guy walks into a doctor's office. Sounds like that's a setup to a joke. A guy walks into a doctor's office and says, Doc, I think I'm a woman. And in, in the olden days of the Hippocratic Oath, when medicine was seeking to solve problems and pathologies, fix them, uh, remedy them, the, the doctor would say, oh, yeah, okay, well, you're not a woman, and so let's, let's discuss why you think you're a woman, and let's maybe figure out if there are some uh, habits that you have and unresolved issues that are leading you to this conclusion. Now, though, the, doc, the patient walks into the doctor's office, the doctor says, oh, yeah, of course you're a woman. Let's chop you up. Hey, here's some poison that will permanently alter your biochemistry. Yeah, let's go for it. But actually, a, a detransitioner was at the State of the Union last night. I think it was Chloe Cole was, was there. Uh, it's a big problem. I mean, you're seeing a lot of lawsuits now being uh, filed by people who say, hold on, I trusted the doctors, I trusted my parents, I trusted my teachers, and I trusted that certainly the medical professionals. And they, they not only didn't help to fix my problem, they made the problem much, much worse. That is not only a condition of our medical industry right now, it's a condition of our whole society. But, but you're seeing this in, in Missouri yesterday. It's according to Missouri Representative Justin Sparks tweeted out a picture of this. Uh, there was a hearing for the House Bill 1650. This is a bill that's come up in Missouri to prohibit drag shows for kids. It's amending the law on public sexual performances. Basically says kids shouldn't be uh, the, the audience for these lurid sexual shows. And so a bunch of weirdos show up to protest this, one of whom dresses like a demon. So the libs tell us, the pro people, they say, how dare you suggest that there's something demonic about uh, denying or even inverting the, the basic distinction in human nature? How dare you suggest there's something occult or demonic about uh, attacking the basic building block of society, the family, and, and totally perverting that? 
uh, how dare you not allow me to dress up like Baal and show up to protest some bill? You know, this person sitting there in this crazy getup uh, uh, speaking, and you're just waiting for the, the legislator to say, you know, okay, all right, um, uh, now to discuss how has no connection whatsoever to Gnosticism or the occult is uh, Senator Baphomet. Uh, Senator Baphomet, you have two minutes. You have the floor. And I love, actually, that the Missouri State House is taking this up because it just, it just shows you the reality of the issue. That's why I really like all of these speeches. It just shows you what's really going on. Uh, there's another Missouri bill right now that is uh, threatening teachers who peddle this kind of nonsense. I love, this is a really good bill. You would think HB 1650 is good. This one's amazing. HB 2885. This is a bill that would make it a felony offense for school teachers or counselors to support or contribute to the social Now we're talking, baby. This is good stuff. This is conservatives. And I I love Missouri. The Missouri Republicans, they have their heads, heads screwed on straight. They recognize we're not going to do this. In fact, the first, as far as I can tell, the first big uh, college speeches calling attention to this were my, my speaking tour years ago, uh, which it was the Men Are Not Women and Other Uncomfortable Truths tour. It was the first time I was ever attacked in public. I was at University of Missouri, Kansas City, and some wacko pro type people came in and attacked me during my speech because I said men and women are different. And uh, the state senators, the Republicans, including Eric Burleson, who's now a member of Congress, invited me back to the state capitol in Missouri to, to finish giving that speech because they said, look, maybe some squishes around the country are going to give up on this issue. We are not. They took it very, very seriously. And you're, you're seeing this right now, actually, at the federal level. Uh, the House just passed a great bill. That's fine. We're, it's so unusual these days for congressional Republicans to do anything that we're always shocked when that sort of thing happens. This is the lakin riley Act. It's a uh, this refers to the, the pin, obviously, that a lot of us were wearing last night at the State of the Union. The Lake and Riley Act r- refers ultimately to this, this poor girl, Lake and Riley, Georgia student who was murdered ostensibly by an illegal alien. And uh, we talked about the bill a few days ago and I said, can the Democrats vote against this? All it says is that illegal aliens who commit theft, as uh, Lake and Riley's alleged murderer did, must be arrested. That's It's so mild. It's so moderate. And even still, a lot of Republicans voted, or a lot of Democrats rather, voted against it. 37 Republicans ultimately joined, excuse me, 37 Democrats ultimately joined all of the Republicans in supporting this bill and uh, condemning the way that the administration is handling the southern border right now. It means a lot of Democrats didn't, but the bill put enough of a face on the situation. It, was, it, it showed the present situation to be sufficiently egregious that 37 Democrats could not ignore it. That is the way to make laws. You've got, the Democrats are very good at personalizing their terrible vision for the country. We need, to, we need to personalize our positive vision. You know, Jeremy's Razors is doing the unthinkable. This is a sale you can't miss out on. Jeremy's Razors is lowering all prices for every razor. You want a trial set? Lower price. You want the starter set that comes with more cartridges? Lower price. Smooth 6, Precision 5, you guessed it. Lower price. Take advantage of Jeremy's March of Manness now. You get it? It's a pun. I'm a sucker for a good pun. Jeremy'sRazors.com to get your razor at a discount right now. Our mailbag. Finally, finally, we have reached it. It's my favorite time of the week. And our mailbag is sponsored by Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, to start saving on wireless today. Take it away. Hey, Michael. Jackson here. You often state on your show that men and women have the same souls, claiming that if souls were gendered, then men and women would be different species. Now, I greatly respect St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle, but I fear if we do not allow for souls to be gendered, we will eventually lose the debate. If we say that sex is only derived from the body, then in 300 years or less, when the technology is able to completely alter a man's body so that he's identical genetically to that of a woman, we would have to seed that the man is really a woman. However, I still believe that even when that happens, that man, deep down, will still be a man. He is bound metaphysically to his sex. I think that men and women can have different souls without being different species. I do not think it to be too far-fetched to claim that within the category of human soul, there are two different types, male and female. 
St. Edith Stein also makes a similar case. Um, So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks. I totally understand your uh, fear here. You'll say, well, Michael, your view of the way the soul relates to the body is based on St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Thomas Aquinas could not have foreseen technological advances, so we don't want to put ourselves in a corner here. And there have been other people who have uh, made made other arguments. I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas is basically the smartest person ever to have lived, (laughs) and he reconciles the Platonic and the Aristotelian traditions and uh, baptizes all of it through Christianity, and he's just, you know, it's not wise to... uh, disagree with St. Thomas Aquinas, but but I, I see your fear. I guess I don't share that fear. The, the first part of your fear, which is someday technology will advance enough to replace all the cells in our body and, and make us physically uh, totally identical with whichever sex we prefer to uh, pretend to be. I don't think that can happen. And th- the reason for that is just uh, logical. It's not even technological, which is that we are in time and space. So, the, the, the Thomistic view, the St. Thomas Aquinas view of the body and the soul is that, and, and of gender, is that gender or sex is an inseparable accident of the individual owing primarily to the body. So we're, we're body, we're matter, and we're soul, and the soul is the substantial form of the body. And uh, we are, the soul is human, you know, that's why men and women are the same species, but we have this sexual distinction, which comes primarily from the body. But it's an inseparable accident that applies to the individual. You, you cannot, unlike what the Gnostic, modern and ancient Gnostics believed, you can't actually separate body and soul on this earth. So that inseparable accident applies to the whole individual, so long as that individual is an individual you know, for, for the entirety of your life. So you might say, well, someday we're going to be really, really good at making the identifying people look like their preferred sex, or will even change their cells. But that person will still have been the the real sex that he is. He will still have developed that way from the very moment of conception, because the life begins not just when his soul, you know, popped into existence in the ether or something, but when he, as body and soul, uh, together develop as an incarnate being. So that, that, you'd have to go back so far, you'd have to go back to the very, very beginning to change who that person is, and then it would be a meaningless statement to say that he's, he just, from the moment he has a body, you know, he he is who he is. So I I think, I I, I see the fear in theory, I just don't think it's one really ever that we'll have to worry about. Uh, Next one. Hello, Michael, I hope you're doing well. You've said before that watching a daily political show makes you more informed about politics than most Americans. I watch three. I watch yours, Ben's, or Matt's every single day, as well as a second show that many would claim to be a far-right extremist, and a third show that I would claim is a fake conservative show. I do this to avoid biasy in my information. I know that you work with many conservative college students, such as myself, so I knew that you'd be perfect to answer this question. How do I convince people, and how do any other conservative college students, convince people that 19, 20 year old conservatives do know what they're talking about and they can bring good arguments to the table and not to have people just throw us to the side like we're white supremacists or something. Thank you in advance. The best way is to have some humility. That's the way to do it. Young people, they want to talk all the time, but there's an old adage, which is, it is better to keep your mouth shut and be thought an idiot than to open your mouth and prove it. And it's kind of funny because I'm on a talk show where all I do is just sit in front of a camera and talk. But, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, there is a great fear actually there where you say, if you're just blabbing all the time, you're going to seem very foolish. So you've got to be very careful and, uh, circumspect in some of your claims. And this is especially true for young people who are taken to, uh, great gusts of passion and who just necessarily don't know as much as they would if they continued to educate themselves. So this doesn't mean that young people have nothing to offer. In some cases, they have more to offer than the older people some rare limited cases. But the, the way that you can convey that is with some humility. And uh, the, the other way you can convey that, and I think it's very wise that you listen to all sorts of different perspectives, is if you can articulate all the points of view on a, on a particular subject, if you can say, okay, well, here's what a, a mainstream sensible person, I, I guess I would be called a far-right radical extremist fascist or whatever by you know NBC News, but you'd say, okay, someone like Michael, who's really sensible and 
uh, quite articulate, and devilishly handsome, and just really sexy. And someone like him, he would say this. And then someone who's, I don't know, some extreme, crazy Nietzschean, whatever, he would say this. And then some communist would say this. And then some center-left liberal would say this. And this is why they all view this situation differently. And here's why I'm inclined to favor, probably, let's say my view, just hypothetically. Uh, if you can show that you've considered all of the perspectives, you can make the strongest case for all those perspectives, you, you'll also be taken more seriously. Because you'll be uh, presenting to the people you're trying to convince uh, probably many more facets of the issue than even they have considered. And they will have to take you seriously. Next one. Hi, Michael. I hope you're well. My Filipino immigrant parents hold pro-Second Amendment, pro-life, pro-legal immigration, and law and order values. But even though they do vote, they don't follow politics closely and don't associate these principles as strictly Republican or conservative. They see them as common sense and assume both parties agree and actually vote Democrat due to the media's unfavorable depictions of conservatives. How do you suggest I initiate a conversation with them to encourage them to consider voting for the Republican candidate in November without hitting them over the head with it? Thanks for your insights. Sincerely, Nicole, the girl who gave you the Trump reputation air shirt at CPAC. Oh, hey, great. Nice to hear from you. That's fabulous. So the way to do it is people have some prejudice. You know, uh, I have a friend who says, facts don't care about your feelings, but politics cares almost exclusively about your feelings. That's true for everyone, including your parents. What I would do is say, okay, mom and dad, I'm, I'm trying to think about who to vote for this year. Do you think I should vote for the candidate who says we need to have functional borders and we need to uh, have, uh, you know, we need to engage in X, Y, and Z economic policy and we need to uh, engage in ABC foreign policy and the candidate who does this, this, and you just describe the campaign platform of the various candidates. Not even necessarily what they actually did or the likelihood that they'll be able to fulfill, fulfill the promises. Just, just what the candidates are seeking in their own words, on their own terms. And from what you're telling me about your parents, they'll, they'll say, oh yeah, the first guy, give me the first guy. Say, okay, so I'm just reading from the campaign platform of Donald Trump. So you want that, and you don't want the guy who uh, disagrees with him on all these issues. So you want Trump. And just allow them to, oh, okay. And you know, it doesn't need to be a big gotcha or anything like that. And you'll say, hey, guys, yeah, you, look, Biden's slippery. He some, you know, he, he's got an interesting PR team. But yeah, you, you've just told me you support Trump. So it's all good. Uh, let's get to at least one written mailbag question before we go. This is from Ava. Dear Nostradamus, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on matchmaking. I'm Jewish and my aunt and uncle were set up by a matchmaker. They've been married 14 years and currently have six kids. All right, nice. That's very good. I've been considering matchmaking because I desperately want to get married, but I feel like it takes away the organic aspect of meeting a potential spouse. I'm 21 and feel like I still have time to meet guys organically, but it hasn't worked out for me yet. My aunt said there's no harm in trying, but I'm a little apprehensive. What are your thoughts on matchmaking and should more young people try it uh, because my generation is becoming less social by the day? Also, Professor Jacob is really cute. All right, calm down. Hold on. Did, who wrote this? Who, there's no way this is a real girl, is it? Did, there's no way. He wrote, the, Professor Jacob wrote this, obviously. Okay, so we can just skip the question. No, I'll answer as though it's a real person. Sincerely, Chicken Soup from the Creme de la Creme Inner Circle. Okay, Chicken Soup. Okay. Uh, what I would recommend here is recognizing that any way you meet your future spouse is going to be a kind of a matchmaking, right? It's going to be a matchmaking by your aunt, or it's going to be a matchmaking by the apps, or it's going to be a matchmaking by your friends, wherever your friends are, at your work, at the synagogue, at the school, at whatever. Or it's going to be a matchmaking by your social circumstances. But there's it's not, you're never totally open to totally, without any limits or constraints, just to totally organically meet someone. There's no, it's not like, you know, the man of your dreams is just going to materialize out of thin air. It's always going to come from within some kind of social circumstances. And so I'm not telling you go and have your aunt set you up and go get married. If you really do want to get married quickly and start having children, then, you know, if you want to speed things up, that's one way to do it. But you can go play the field. I think it's great. I'm very pro dating. It's, I think dating is fun. The way that people on the left and the right and the men and the women talk about dating now, it's like, it's so, you know, 
heavy and clinical and it's so depressing. I don't know. I think it's fun. I think the opposite sex is fun and it's kind of delightful to go on dates with them. But if, if you're not finding it delightful or you're not, you know, you're not finding the right kind of guys, then I, I don't see anything wrong or, or artificial about saying, hey, Ann, can you, do you know any nice guys? I mean, that's just how people date. You're either asking your app or you're asking your friends or you're asking your matchmaker aunt. And so the, the, then the only question is, who knows you better? And who knows marriage better? And who's more likely to get you a stud, you know, some nice, nice hunk that you can start having lots of kids with? From Celeste, Michael, I have two questions. One, do you consider cigar smoking to be primarily a male pastime? I do, though there are women who like cigars too. Or does SLA join you in burning Mayflowers? She does not. She likes that I go outside and smoke the Mayflowers. I actually, I'm going to confess something right now. I confess this to Mr. Davies. I, after the State of the Union, you know, I'm friends with some legislators here and I don't get to Washington so much. I was up having some Mayflower cigars uh, until the wee small hours of the morning. Luckily, we didn't have anything too strong to drink, so I'm sprightly and happy to, but the the Mayflower, we, we went from Mayflower dusk to Mayflower dawn. Let's put it that way. Okay, second question. What is the significance of the name Bent Key in the Daily Wire's children's show section? I figure it must refer to Jeremy Boring's key necklace, but what is the meaning behind it? Thank you. Speaking of going out and having cigars and staying up all night, uh, many years ago, before my wedding, I'd been asking Jeremy, hey, what's the deal with the key thing? And he never told me. He said, this is a story. Only a very select few get this story. And Jeremy and I, you know, were and are and have been very close friends for a long time. And he said, no, you're not ready. And so one night, it was right before my wedding, we were out quite late in New York, and he tells me the story. And it's, it's an amazing, so yes, the bent key refers to the bent key on his neck, but what does the bent key on his neck refer to? You got to ask him. That's not my story to tell. Okay. It is Fake Headline Friday. And I believe, do we have the iPad? We do. We do. Because Mr. Davies is on the road with me and not that jerk, Professor Jacob, who forgets my iPad. So the rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Bye. <laughs> 